Breaking the news with Des Clark. I am Des Clark and this is Breaking the News, the show that breaks a week's news and asks four opinionated panellists to put it back together again. And we are coming to you from the heart of the Glasgow International Comedy Festival. <laughs> As always, I'm joined by four fantastic comedians. On my right, we have Mark Nelson and Amy Matthews. And up against them are Susan Riddle and Robin Ince. In the news this week, the door which kept Rose alive in the film Titanic has sold for over $700,000. The priceless prop will always be associated with Leonardo DiCaprio's character's beautiful last words. Budge up, love, there's room for two. <laughs> Puberty makes teenagers' armpits smell of cheese, goat and urine. Say scientists, older listeners will recall that cheese, goat and urine used to be the support band for Earth, Wind and Fire. <laughs> And a Scottish secondary school is addressing the escalating problem of teenage vaping by putting vape detectors in its toilets. If pupils vape, the alarms go off immediately and a text message alerts teachers who have to drop their fags and run straight to the scene. <laughs> <laughs> right, you've met the panel. Let's crack on with round one. <laughs> This is the Broken News Round, where our teams have to guess two major stories of the week that have been mashed together into one single news headline. So, Mark and Amy, can you tell me what this is all about? The latest results for a long-running survey says public satisfaction with... The Chinese state... ...is at its lowest level on record. Only 24% of people questioned in England, Scotland and Wales... ...have been sanctioned by the UK government because of cyber attacks. The Scottish government needs to wake up to security threats from... ...the NHS. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Well, what do we think the first story might be? Amy, any ideas? I think one of them's definitely the NHS satisfaction as a whole is at an all-time low. I will take that. That is the right answer. Well done, Amy. The latest results from the long-running British Social Attitude Survey suggest that public satisfaction with the NHS has fallen to its lowest level since polling was first carried out. Only 24% of people who were questioned in Scotland, England and Wales said they were satisfied with the health service last year. That's a fall of five percentage points on the previous year. Most people blaming long waits for GPs, hospital appointments, staff short Shortages and Charlie being written out of casualty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Amy, well done on getting the right answer. What do you think then? Do you agree with these findings? Well, yes, but also I think it's really important to mention that I, it's not the NHS failing, it's the NHS working under a government that's failing them. And I think that's a really important distinction. Um, it's really dispiriting because you you can see it happening you know people say oh we're not privatizing the nhs we're sort of low-key being privatized because we see the service getting so bad and so underfunded that it means people are having to seek private health care who would never have ordinarily been able to afford or, or found it. And it's a little bit like, you know, when you're in a, a bad relationship and instead of the person who wants to be out of it having the bravery to end it, they start behaving terribly <laughs> so that you turn around and go, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to end this. And they're like, how could you do this to me? It's a little <laughs> bit like that. And in both cases of the failing government and a failing relationship, it's immoral, it's cowardly, and everyone's encouraged to end up on an app. <laughs> um. Susan, what do you think? You've heard the results here of this survey. Do you agree with these findings? I do, and I don't usually like blame the patient, like, but there is one. <laughs> <laughs> there is one cohort that I'm like, because I broke my toe, right? And I, uh. <laughs> I had to go to the hospital, right? And I waited for six hours. And while I was there, I noticed that there's a kind of pandemic going on, like, and it's been going on for ages, like, no, no, the one that we know about. Uh, and, and, and this pandemic is men over the age of 35 playing five-a-sides football. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Honestly, the wards were full of them. I'm no joking. <laughs> Honestly. And, and they were all limping about with their wee strained ligaments and their <laughs> groins hurting them. And I was just like, do you realise the burden you're putting on the NHS? <laughs> like, just bloody grow up. Do you know what I mean? Listen, <laughs> Susan, I pay my taxes like anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I deserve. <laughs> uh, Robin, I'll bring you into this, obviously. Yeah. What do you think, then? As you quite rightly said, Amy, you know, it is about support. It is about the fact that if there's one thing that should be financed, it is to make sure that everyone can live as long a life as possible. And, you know, and I also, because I need 24 hours in A&E to exist on television, because... <laughs> 24 hours in A&E, as you know, you finish a gig, it's midnight, you get back to a budget hotel, you turn on the television, there are the loveliest old couple in the world, and one of them's fallen out of a plum tree, and <laughs> you are... <laughs> yes. And you watch it, and you just see two people in their 90s, you go, oh, look at all of this love, and tears start... And, and the woman's there going, oh, we met in 1945, and he said he loved me when he came back from the war, and it's all so beautiful. And then you just sit there and you go, oh, as long as you don't show their voting record. You know, and it's just... <laughs> <laughs> Perfect for that. Uh, Mark, what do you think about this then? What can we do to improve satisfaction in the NHS? I think there should be much more of a rollout of rewards for being a brave boy. <laughs> <laughs> because I will take my eight year old son to the optician or the dentist or the doctor and he gets a wee sticker. You know, it's a great system. So I think if I ever go with like an ingrown toenail or something like that. Imagine how nice it would be if they said, you've been a really brave boy, and then handed me a pint. <laughs> <laughs> I can see. Uh, Susan, what do you make about this then? What can we do to improve satisfaction in the NHS? Right, I think um, just get better magazines in the GP waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God, right, this is the truth. I was at the doctor's not that long ago and they only had one magazine and it was Yachting Monthly. <laughs> <laughs> and it was in Toll Cross Surgery. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> read the room, nobody's got a yacht room here. <laughs> like, like get, a, get a wee chat magazine or a wee take a break. I mean, you say nobody's been in Yachting Monthly, but was Michelle Moan in the front cover by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> well done, Mark and Amy. You get two points for that. It was, of course, the survey into NHS satisfaction. Right, over to you, Susan and Robin. What was the other story we were after? I've got... I think this is about the Chinese kind of cyber attack or cyber security thing. Yes, uh, the UK government has formally accused China of being behind what it's called malicious cyber campaigns against MPs and the Electoral Commission. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden says there were attempts to access details of MPs critical of Beijing, as well as the data of potentially 40 million voters. In a statement rejecting the claim, the Chinese embassy said, we have no interest or need to meddle in the UK's internal affairs. Scottish relations with China have massively improved since they announced 2024 as the Year of the Dragon, with the streets of Beijing covered head to toe with murals of Duncan Bannatyne. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, then, about these accusations, Susan? Um, well, there's that new app that's supposed to be stealing all your information and stuff, that... Te is it Temu? Temu? Mm. And that's, like, a Chinese app, and they're, they're saying that um, there's, like, a lawsuit against them saying that they're taking all your information, like, harvesting your information and, oh, your phone's listening to you and stuff like that. And I'm just like, well, it's just nice to have somebody listening. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring you into this then, Mark. What do you make of these accusations then? Can you imagine how easy it must be to hack our government? Like, do you honestly... Look at the mess they've made of absolutely everything. Do you honestly think they take security seriously? <laughs> like, I bet Boris Johnson, when he was Prime Minister, his password was something like the Big Dog 69 <laughs> <laughs> It's obviously been a big story around this week around cyber security. What do you think we can do about it? Or is it now just part of modern life? What do you think, Robin? Anything we can do about this? I am addicted to TikTok as a 55-year-old. I love it. I'm, I'm, <laughs> do I need to, anyone of you watch that? There's these really badly made short films that mainly seem to come from Eastern Europe, which are always about someone making a poor decision and losing their job. And they're fantastic. Why are you stopping to help the blind man across the road? You won't make the job interview in time and I'm going to get it. And then the blind man turns up and the man in charge of the company goes, oh, father. Oh, no, this is your father. I recognise that voice. That's the man who did not help me across the road. I love him. 
I love, I love all that. That sounds great, Robin. Robin Sorry, when... if you don't know it, do any of you watch that stuff? No, oh, when my. you said I love TikTok, I was about to say, no, 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 it's called Countdown. <laughs> <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> Uh, what can be done about this then, Mark? Or do we have to accept it's just part of modern life? No, I don't. I don't think we take uh, our own personal security seriously enough. I like to think of myself as being quite a savvy, switched-on person who would never get scammed. And I am planning on updating to get the biggest and most expensive security system on my computer. Just as soon as that Nigerian prince sends me, <laughs> I will be... <laughs> you just wire it straight into your account, Mark. You'll be fine. Sorted. Nothing can go wrong. The UK government summoned the Chinese ambassador to answer allegations of spying. The minister said he'd be free on Monday, and the ambassador said, I know, I cleared it in your calendar. <laughs> <laughs> Well done, Susan and Robin. You get two points for that. It was the mashup of a survey about the NHS and accusations of a cyber attack from China, meaning at the end of the round, the teams are all square. <laughs> Now, much of our news is about public opinion, so to find out what stories people are talking about, we spoke to two friends of the show, Herald columnist Brian Taylor and journalist and broadcaster Afia Hagen. So, Susan and Robin, what do you think Brian is on about here? I'm not surprised that scientists are investigating this. That They've tried warning us in every other way they know. They tried warning us about the deserts, they tried warning us about the, the polar ice caps. Nobody paid any attention. But this... I mean, this really matters. Um, the, it, the, the, the taste of beer is changing because, as with so many things, the actual the, the, the hops themselves are changing due to climate change. That's a perfect answer, Robin. Well done. Yeah, it is the news that scientists are working with the brewing industry to help save traditional British beer from the effects of climate change. Hops gives it bitter its taste, but the plant doesn't like the hotter, drier conditions we've experienced in recent decades, and production has plummeted. But researchers in Kent are isolating hop genes in the hope of producing more climate change resilient varieties. There were reports that climate change protesters had glued themselves to the floor of a pub, uh, but it turned out it was just a guy that fallen onto a sticky carpet <laughs> in the <Edelstone>. <laughs> <laughs> Easy mistake to make. <laughs> Oh, well done at getting the right answer then, Robin. What are your thoughts then on this scientific work? Well, I, do, I genuinely think this is a, a really important thing because that's the kind of thing. It will be what you might consider... When I say mundane, I'm not saying beer is mundane, but that bit of going, I didn't know it was going to affect my beer, you know, <laughs> and I've also heard it's affecting both cheese and onion. Then you've kind of, you know, got a... <laughs> it's at that point yeah, when yeah. you're drinking the worst beer ever, you think Greta was right. Yeah. <laughs> Susan, what are your thoughts then on this scientific work? Everybody knows, like, uh, like people are worried their beer's going to taste honking, but as long as you can get through the first one, then the second <laughs> one tastes better. <laughs> <laughs> You, you guys are exactly right. It's, um, it is so much easier to be motivated to find solutions to things that feel like they affect you, you know. And I think finding creative solutions to um, a lot of the effects of climate change are getting increasingly more important. I've given it a thought myself as well. Uh, obviously, one of the worst ones is flooding. Um, and I've come up with a one-word solution. Mm. Weetabix. <laughs> Bung three of those in there. It'd be absolutely... Honestly, if you put three Weetabix in Loch Lomond, by the end of the day, you'd be able to fit it in a ramekin. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most absorbent material known to mankind. There you go. Sorted. Climate change done and dealt with. Do you think there should be a priority, then, when it comes to climate change? Does it give us a focus, Susan? No, I think the priority should be ginger people, cos surely... <laughs> <laughs> Like, I'm ginger and we'll be the first to pay it. I'm like, what factor am I going to need to put on in the future? <laughs> I am actually involved in a ginger saviour programme because, like, I don't know if you remember the heat wave of 2020. Mm. Um, we used to be 98% ginger people in this country mm. and that decimated it. <laughs> we, we, only, we only have two left, right? <laughs> But what me and a lot of other guys are going to do, we're going to send both of those two ginger people to a zoo in China. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to try and get them to mate. <laughs> because ginger people don't mate naturally. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I can confirm yeah. this. <laughs> of course, scientists first highlighted the potential beer shortage at their annual conference in Glasgow, Hop 26. <laughs> Yes, bulking up beer for the climate change is the right answer. Well done, Susan and Robin. Over to you, Mark and Amy. It's your turn. What do you think Afia is talking about here? Seems like they understand much more than we anticipated. I feel like they're just using selective hearing. I've got a lot of people like that in my life, actually. Is it that they are, in fact, just ignoring us and choosing to hear what they want? It's dogs. Apparently dogs can understand nouns. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a joke, that's the right answer. <laughs> as surprising as it is, well done, Mark, that's a great spot. This is the interesting story that, according to research, dogs can understand what certain words stand for. The findings suggest that the dog brain can reach beyond commands such as sit and fetch to grasp the essence of nouns, or at least those that refer to items that the animals care about. In 2011, a border collie called Chaser had learned the names of more than 1,000 objects, as they were all things his owner had told him off for humping. <laughs> It's true, it's true. Yeah. Well, I, I want to know what cats understand. <laughs> Everything. Exactly. <laughs> right. I, I bet cats can understand full sentences and they just choose to not engage with us. <laughs> <laughs> That's the observation. That's the survey we want. Uh, Amy, what do you think then? Do you agree? Can dogs understand more than we think? Well, my partner's dog walks towards me bum first. <laughs> um, my sister's dog has his business unsheathed on a permanent basis. <laughs> my granddad's dog tries to copulate with the sofa, and my friend's dog wants ate and regurgitated faecal matter. So I think the one phrase we know it, they definitely can't understand is, stop it, that's unbecoming. <laughs> <laughs> Every single one of those instances sound like a stag do I've been... <laughs> It's all becoming very clear, isn't it? <laughs> Susan, do you agree with us? Can dogs understand more than we think? Yeah. Do you know, actually, I read this article. There's going to be AI in the future that your dog is going to be able to talk to you, right? And I'm just like, well, that's just going to ruin dogs, isn't it? Like, what if you find out, like, your dog's a Tory or something? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> if you're just like sitting watching Question Time and he's nodding along, where is she soon at? <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be chaos because then it'll be like, oh, get the German shepherds back to Germany and all that. Do you know what I mean? Like. <laughs> well, <It'll be> terrible. <laughs> Before we get even more to the right, um, what do you think about this then, Robin? <laughs> I, I mean, I do love dogs, and I, but I, I think you're right as well, just that in terms of the, you know, if you could hear what a dog thought, it would just be kind of floor, hungry, <laughs> floor, hungry. That's having floor, a boyfriend. Uh, yeah, that would be... A, yeah. <laughs> um, what a revelation. Dogs can understand between 15 and 215 words, including rubber toys, slippers and leashes, which is also the dress code for the Tory party conference. <laughs> Yes, well done, dogs. Understanding more than we might think is the right answer. And two points go to Mark and Amy. <laughs> You're listening to Breaking the News from BBC Radio Scotland with me, Des Clark. Now, this round is all about who's in the news. I will play you a clip of a mystery person. All you have to do is tell me who it is. So, Mark and Amy, you're first this time. Who is this? It wasn't until the last kilometre that I really sort of doubted that it was going to be possible. And at that point, I was just so desperate to stop and to stop running and to walk. I think that is the incredible Jasmine Paris. Well done. That is the right answer. That is indeed Jasmine Paris. She's the first female runner to complete one of the world's toughest races, the 100-mile Barclay Marathon in the United States. Jasmine from Midlothian said she wanted to test the limits of what she was capable of and inspire others. Afterwards, Jasmine was greeted by cheers from her family and tears from those people who'd sponsored her per <laughs> mile. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, Amy, brilliant answer. Well done. What do you think, then, of Jasmine's achievement? Obviously incredible, absolutely incredible. But she said afterwards that she, she did it for herself, but also to help inspire women and make them feel better and empowered and more confident. I challenge you to find a single woman who looked at that and didn't feel awful. <laughs> She's made us all feel dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, what about this? Jasmine Paris, what do you think of Jasmine's achievement? Hi, good for her. Uh, no, it's not for her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit more like Amy. It's not for me. Right, it's, it's not for me. I, I've tried to exercise and like sometimes I've been to a boot camp and stuff like that, and I was talking to other people, and some people like it when you feel the burn, and I'm like, no, right? I don't like that, and I never feel it in the right places, right? So I, see, when I'm doing like press ups, I'll feel the burn in my forearms, right? And when I'm trying to do squats, I'll feel the burn in my calves, and I'm like, what am I going to come out of this boot camp looking like? Yeah. <laughs> it's like big meaty Popeye forearms and. Big delivery driver calves, like, no. I <laughs> uh, love that. Uh, Mark, what about you? What would be the most impressive thing that you've ever done? Well, as you know, Des, I've run two marathons. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've run the Edinburgh Marathon uh, twice. And I would advise anyone that is ever thinking of doing it, don't. <laughs> <laughs> Things hurt. Like, I've never used my nipples for anything in my life. <laughs> never. As if I've been breastfeeding a piranha. <laughs> <laughs> You felt the burn all right, oh, didn't listen. you? Oh, <laughs> believe me. Robin, what's the most impressive thing that you've ever done? I did a musical with uh, Ted Rogers and Sue Pollard, and I think that's quite impressive. <laughs> and people don't expect that. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Carmen Silvera from TV's A Low A Low. And uh, it turned out it was a tax dodge. And uh, so I did that. <laughs> And uh, I also was once interviewed by Piers Morgan and I didn't punch him once. So I think that's kind of like... Uh, and well done. It was a really bizarre year because I also supported the Stranglers in Bosnia. And I was like, that is... I know, I say yes to anything that sounds interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the first female runner to complete one of the world's toughest races has said she did it for women worldwide, although they've since responded saying they'd have preferred a gift voucher. <laughs> And yes, well done. Two points to Mark and Amy. That was Jasmine Paris. Right, over to you, Susan and Robin. It's your turn again. Who is this and why are they in the news? You can't stream. Nobody will watch you. You'll never have any followers. So, of course, now he's eating his words. <laughs> I can't explain why. It was just instant love. It was that uh, granny that's a gamer and she's got, like, loads of followers and stuff. Well done, Susan. A 75-year-old Scottish grandmother has become a video gaming sensation after teaming up with one of the world's most famous Fortnite players, Kath Bowie, a.k.a. Grumpy Gran 1948. <laughs> That is her name. Uh, has been hooked in Fortnite since being introduced to it by her grandson. Her skills and hilarious commentary were spotted by US YouTuber Cypher PK, and together they racked up more than half a million views. A lot of the divides between generations, I think, are, are absolute nonsense. You have loads of people who are just curious and excited, and the fact that Fortnite mixes mass murder with dancing, I think, is also very positive. <laughs> <laughs> Can't argue with that. I love that. I love this story as well. Are you surprised, Mark, to see Kath become so popular online? No, not at all. I think it's absolutely brilliant. I think it's brilliant. My gran uh, plays Mario Kart, or as she calls it, drive into the shop. <laughs> <laughs> I love Robin's point, though, about the generations being united. Should more older people be joining the online community? What do you think, Susan? I, I, th I think so, because it's like older people are, like, having a better time than younger people. Like, what happens when you bought a house for £8? <laughs> <laughs> but, like, did you know this? Um, the, the, like, I think it's over 50s or over 60s or something. Uh, they're the largest growing cohort of people with STDs. <laughs> <laughs> Just looking at the demographic of the audience, <laughs> yeah. I know. Some of you better get yourself down to Sandyford. <laughs> get a wee check. <laughs> now, sitting uncomfortably, adjusting themselves. <laughs> so here's the question. Kath Bowie is 75 years old and now famous online for playing Fortnite. What do you see yourself doing at 75? Renting. 
<laughs> um, no. <laughs> no, I almost exclusively drink port. I own more than one book about the shipping forecast and I can't work a printer. I'm already 75. Yeah. <laughs> You're leaning into that yes. one. Yes. Kath Bowie has been playing Fortnite since her grandson introduced her to it five years ago. She leads the only squad that, when they've killed all their opponents, shout, house! <laughs> Well done. Gaming granny Kath Bowie is, of course, the right answer. And two points go to Susan and Robin. <laughs> and it's time now for our final quickfire round, which is all about deciphering the numbers in the news. I will read out a headline. All the teams have to do is fill in the blanks. So get ready, teams. When we run out of time, you'll hear this. What do you do with Gary's bum? <laughs> That's Good Morning Scotland's Laura Maxwell there, struggling to hide her obsession with the lead singer of Take That. OK, fingers on your buzzers, and here we go. Children do what 300 times a day? Robin. A, a little poo that you haven't noticed that's kind of dropped out of their trousers <laughs> until much later on. <laughs> uh, OK, let's get fingers back and buzzers. Children do what 300 times a day? Mark. Remind me that I once had hopes. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Uh, keep it going. Children do what 300 times a day? Amy. Kick the seat behind me on a flight. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lovely answer. Children do what 300 times a day? <laughs> Susan. My not in. <laughs> <laughs> A lovely answer. <laughs> this is true. On average, children laugh 300 times a day. What do you do with Gary's bum? Oh, there is a klaxon. Laura has Maxwell. That means it's all over. And at the end of the quiz, our winners this week are Mark Nelson and Amy Matthews. <laughs> and commiserations to our runners-up, Robin Ince and Susan Riddell. And we'll leave you with the breaking the news, breaking news, just in. Americans are being offered the chance to purchase a Bible endorsed by Donald Trump for a mere $59.99. I'm not saying it's another scam from the former president, but he is charging double for one signed by the author. <laughs> a 270 million year old fossil that sheds light on the origins of amphibians has been named after Kermit, the world's most famous frog. Archaeologists around the world have hailed the discovery, but can't yet explain the fossilised human hand found up the frog's bum. <laughs> And scientists have claimed that pollution is affecting wildlife in our seas, so much so that every single marine species we've looked at so far is full of cocaine. The government have moved quickly on this, with Rishi Sunak convening an emergency committee and Michael Gove grabbing a fishing rod. <laughs> the news is broken. I've been dead, Clark. Goodbye.